Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Squawk 7000. Well, on Friday last, we flew into Waterford Airport for an event to recognise 20 years of CHC Ireland providing helicopter search and rescue services on behalf of the Irish Coast Guard out of Waterford. On the same day, winchman Sarah Courtney, the recipient of a 2021 National Bravery Award, was presented with the CHC Excellence Service Award by Eugene Clonan, Acting Director of the Irish Coast Guard. Winchman Sarah Courtney, Ronan Flanagan, Adrian O'Hara from CHC Waterford Base and Aaron Highland from CHC Shannon Base were awarded bravery certificates after they rescued seven crew members from the Ellie of. It lost power and was in grave danger of sinking 70 nautical miles west of Bantry Bay. The act of bravery, which occurred on March 27, 2021, also saw Sarah Courtney awarded a silver medal. Sarah made a very gracious speech as she accepted the award. Hello everybody and thanks for coming today. It's great to see everybody here together, all together in one room, especially when we all work together and don't get to meet each other in, this, in these kind of circumstances quite often. Um, I'm very honoured to accept this presentation today on behalf of the Coast Guard and uh, our employer CHC and also on behalf of the crew. Um, Adrian O'Hara was the winch operator on that day, Ronan Flanagan was the pilot and Captain Aaron Highland uh, the Very busy airport terminal after the presentation, Sarah explained how she found herself with the career of winchman. Uh, I worked in the ambulance service for 12 years. Uh, I was always interested in the helicopters and also interested in rescue. And combining the two of those in patient care and rescue uh, on the helicopter uh, was a bit of a pinnacle for me. So when the opportunity came up to apply for the recruitment process, I jumped at it and uh, worked hard to get through the recruitment process. Uh, trained with guys here in Waterford to be qualified as winchman and I've been working on the helicopter now for three years here at Waterford Airport. Our previous episode was on women in aviation and one of the common themes that all the women said was they didn't want to be novelties anymore. They wanted to be just seen as active crew. you share that idea? Absolutely. Uh, I feel in this country we're very, we're very fortunate with the, the way that living is in Ireland and I never felt in all of the male-dominated environments that I've been in that I've ever been discriminated for being a female and no different coming into this environment uh, I was treated exactly the same as everyone else and I feel that is how it should be there should be no differentiation between whether you're a man woman or or anything else that anyone identifies with Uh, it's just about the person and your capabilities and doing the job and that's all that that matters for the lay person talking to some Somebody who's involved in something that has an element of bravery in it, they're often curious to know what your, your thought process is and how does your brain work and does it work at normal speed and, and what are you thinking about as, you, as you're heading over towards that boat with seven people on it? You're very focused when you're on a mission like that. We train a lot. When we're not doing missions and we're on shift, then we're out training for these circumstances. So your training really kicks into gear. Uh, Obviously, they're high-stress environments, and our training prepares us for that by having sequences and procedures that we follow. Uh, You're very focused. You're very aware of the situation and your situational awareness and everything that's going on around you. Your feelings really don't come into it uh, because you've just got to you've got to deal with the job at hand when you get back that cup of tea must be very welcome (laughs) (laughs) absolutely and you know there's nothing more rewarding than being able to rescue somebody and all of our main aims when we go out on a tasking or on any flight um, as indeed it is for anybody is that you achieve a good outcome if possible and uh, that everybody it's done safely and everybody's safe and there's minimal injury occurred so uh, there's huge uh, satisfaction
satisfaction and there is huge relief also that everybody uh, was able to leave that festival. Finally, for any young man or one, young woman listening to, to this particular episode, what would your encouragement be to follow your footsteps? I think it's important to look out for what interests you and what you're passionate about. And if you're interested and passionate about something, then it's not as difficult to get there. And nothing worthwhile is ever easy. You don't uh, get to decide that uh, the helicopter looks cool and you'd like to work on that tomorrow. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication. But if it's something that you enjoy, then it won't be difficult at all. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Rob Tatton is the Accountable Manager for CHC in Ireland and he outlined the history of CHC in Waterford and Rescue 117. Well, we've been here 20 years um, and uh, th- this base is one of our four bases, um, Dublin, Sligo, Shannon and Waterford. And we have a huge amount of experience down here built up over the years. And what I'd say to people is when they often see the Coast Guard helicopter out flying, it's not necessarily on a search and rescue mission. Um, It is on a training mission. The majority of the the flights that we do are training. And that ensures that the skills that have been built up over 20 years by the crew is kept proficient and current. And when they need to go and complete a rescue that they're able to do, it successfully and safely more importantly and we're also here today to uh, give an award to winchman Sarah Courtney who lifted seven fishermen on the 27th of March 2021 uh, off a vessel that was sinking um, and it was a successful rescue and it was conducted safely mm-hmm. and again that all goes back to the training that we do here at CHC. Uh, we flew in here ourselves today for the podcast as we were coming in you could see Hookhead and Crookhead and it really is a strategic lo- location for you guys isn't it for the for the for the Irish Sea and, and the Georges Channel. Yes it's it's we, as I was saying we have four bases it's busy down here as well and the coast that they cover down here and funny enough it's uh, it's getting busier because of Brexit mm-hmm. There's more marine traffic coming out of um, uh, Rosslair um, going directly to Europe and we can see it slightly reducing in Dublin and that increase comes into Waterford mm-hmm. so we're definitely getting busier since I've been with the company uh, nearly three years now and it's, de- it's definitely getting you can see it getting busier over the, 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 the last three years particularly in the summer when we have the holiday makers now You're going to introduce us to a couple of the crew and we're going to find out about I suppose what day to day operations here in Waterford Yes we're, we're going to introduce you to Mark Callaghan he's one of our SAR captains uh, Neville Murphy who did one of the podcasts with, with uh, myself before on uh, Squawk 7000 and we have Neil McAdam who's been here 20 years so he's been here from day one and he's helped pull all of this together today with Mark a very special event 20 years now I did have a little break I went back to Dublin for two years but then I came back uh, Warford is now home for me and the one thing about the bases and we've been talking to, to you know the various different people who are in the different bases is they all have their own, their own personality what's the personality of Waterford and the kind of stuff you do I think we have a great um, relationship with the local community. I think the local community very much see um, 117 as their rescue helicopter. I think that's unique uh, to the rest of the country. And absolutely, we're their rescue helicopter. And if you want to give us a bell, we're, we're more than happy to, 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 to go out there and do what we have to do for them. Bring me back 20 years, and then we'll work our way to where we are today. How has the profile of the work changed, or has it changed? Uh, it got busier. And I think because we're here so long, people are aware of us uh, in the area days they weren't aware and there was a rumour going around in the early days that it cost five grand to call us out. <laughs> so people were reluctant to call us out. So we had to work very hard to uh, expel that rumour and, and make, make people aware that that wasn't the, 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 the case and that if they call us out there was no problem. <laughs> Fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> They're all arriving here behind yeah, us as yeah. well Ed, for the event. Um, and yeah, as I was saying to you the, you know, the, in the early days you might have been doing a particular kind of work. Is it getting busier? It's getting busier because there's more people of Obviously, with the pandemic, we had the staycationers who a lot of people got themselves into trouble. A lot of people went into the water that normally wouldn't. From from my own experience, uh, thank God, no, there was no fatalities that I experienced, but um, there were some around the country, unfortunately. People went hill walking as well, and uh, you know they weren't wearing very sensible shoes and breaking ankles and stuff. But other than that, um, you, you do the, the normal run of stuff, like fishermen injured, that type of thing, and uh, air ambulance, and the other one over to London. I'm back. Yeah. How did you get into this? I always wanted to be a soldier, so I joined the army. 
and when I joined the army they transferred me to the air corps and I was in the air corps seeing these guys walk around in funny funny suits <laughs> so I made an inquiry I said who are these guys and they said, the cook said to me they're the search and rescue crew so I said I want that yeah. I'm going to do that so um, I done my search and rescue course in 1989 it's gone back quite a ways and thank God passed it mm-hmm. and uh, yeah joined the Dublin base in 2000 and came down here in 2002 and what is the work that you specifically do on the helicopter then when it goes out in a cold? Well, I'm a winchman, winch operator, so primarily, primarily a winch operator at the moment, so we would uh, lower the winchman and give him whatever equipment he needs. He'll do the rescue, whether it be on a boat or uh, taking somebody out of water. And once he's happy, he'll winch him back up, get back into the aircraft safely. What control do you have over the helicopter at that point? Are you are you doing it verbally, or do you have and what input can you make as yeah, to well, where the helicopter positions yeah, itself? Yeah, it's variable. It, 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 for the most part, it's variable. So the pilot can't see directly under him. Hmm. So he's following my patter, is what yeah. it's called. So the, the, the language we use on board. And if I say go forward three and right, the helicopter will go forward three and right. If we say go back, it will go back. But the, that's the pilot responded to my power. Hmm. We also have um, a, a, a crew hover um, that I can actually take control of the aircraft with. It's limited, but it's it's the so to get you into tighter spots that, that you wouldn't normally go into yeah. and because the pilot can't see it I might actually be able to guide it a little bit more precise than he could What's the connection between you then and the person who's on the wire? He or she is the winchman mm. now They are attached to the helicopter through the cable so basically they're really putting their lives in their hands mm. um, so because I'm the winch operator I'm standing at the door so I can see them at all times so it would be my decision whether to put them on the bow or say mm, it's getting a bit hairy and not put them on the bow mm. uh, but they're really putting their safety into our, into our hands so really, there's a lot of trust there so. but there's also a lot of training you, you do okay. a lot of practice I, I'm imagining some for example coming up to something like a trawler with you know uh, aerials and radars and all the bits and pieces on it that, that's when you're focused you're very focused you're also it's, weather conditions are the, the big thing there because a, a small fishing boat will move will move mm-hmm. quickly on, on the on the water it will roll again it will pitch and it's the pitch going up and down is the problem if you get your timing wrong as the winch operator the winch one will get hurt mm. it, it, it's so it'll come up and meet it will meet yeah. him and it will hit, hit him or her yeah. so what you got to do is most boats have they have a rhythm the sea has a rhythm so you, you observe the boat figure out what's rhythm and when it settles mm. that's when you put the winchman on the deck mm. so it's, it's timing's everything in the 20 years any particular memorable experiences that you've had <laughs> The first rescue we ever did down here as Rescue 117 it was, it was on the 11th of May uh, 2002 and it was a guy who was literally hanging by his fingernails off a cliff down in Bunmahan. And what was really... What stands out for me on that one was that, that he just got a bit too close. He fell, but his wife and six-year-old child were standing there watching it. Mm. And uh, it was one of those rescues where if I was the winchman on that one, had I have hit him or bumped off him the wrong way, I could have, he, he could have fallen. So it had to be really precise. And um, thank God we were able to get him and, and bring him home to his, his wife and child. Finally, I suppose, let's talk about today. I believe you have been the man behind putting all of the events together. And you've kept yourself busy with it too. It's been pretty busy. So, um, but I had lots of help yeah. in fairness and uh, Aidan Power the airport manager here has been great help and our own guys have been fantastic so uh, me being the guy to pull it together not really there was plenty of us involved Barry O'Connor has been one of the pilots at the base in Waterford for the past 20 years Barry explained more about the helicopter Rescue 117 OK we're using the Sikorsky S92 uh, an American built aircraft it replaced the Sikorsky S61 which I flew before that um, there, it's, it's like a, just a big improvement on the S61. The S61 was a great aircraft, uh, but it was just starting to show its age. Uh, so along came the S92. Uh, it's far more, it's just far more efficient. It's faster. It can lift more. Uh, it's a twin engine aircraft. And we have a small little APU as well, which we use to start the engines, uh, which is very useful also when we're, we're landing, say, in fields. We can basically shut down the engines if we're bringing a casualty in and out on the, the ramp, but we can leave the APU running for, again, for, for quick startup. For if we get a second shout, for example, or we're bringing the casualty to hospital. Tell us a little bit more about that, the idea of being in a state of readiness and what a typical shift is like when you arrive till, till, till the time you spend and how you're ready to go. Okay, sure. Well, the, the, the shift starts officially at uh, 1300 hours. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you're, you're in by kind of 1230 to relieve your opposite number. So your opposite number
number will tell you what they did on the shift before, if there's any issues with the aircraft, any snags that there may be. Uh, you may have kind of a, a, a tasking that day. When I say a tasking, it might be like a Coast Guard exercise. We're working with all the ground teams, which, which we work with regularly, and, and it's great to work with them. Uh, or even other events, like maybe a school visit or something like that. So generally speaking, you're ready to go. Uh, also the weather, so you come in, we do the weather, we do the planning. So effectively by 1300, we're ready to go. Uh, and then we're um, on a 15 minute readiness up to 9 p.m. Now, we're near the end of May here now, so come the 1st of June, we'll actually change the ch- timings for the three wi- uh, summer months, I should say. Mm. So for June, July and August, we'll actually go to 10 p.m. on 15 minutes readiness, and we'll be back in for 8.30, whereas normally we'll be back in for 7.30. Uh, and during the, uh, the, the hours of standby time, after like, uh, during the, the night time, uh, we're at 45 minutes. So generally speaking, if you live within 20 minutes of the base, we'll be in uh, if we get a call out. And what happens normally is the duty captain will get the call, and he will basically approve the, the shout or whatever. And describe that 15 minutes for us as to what what, what happens. A message comes from a central location and you're ready to go. Yeah, look, we have a, a dedicated scramble phone. Um, so that, that rings and, and basically that, that also ring in the hangar so the engineers are, are, are listening straight away. So if the aircraft is not already out, it'll be, be taken out. Um, depending on the, the where we're going, we have a, a standard fuel of about two and a half hours. So I will either ask the engineers for more fuel, if it's a, if it's a further away job, or I think it's going to take a little bit more time or our standard fuel. Uh, we'll also have a quick look at the weather, uh, particularly if it's a, a poor day, to give us any alternates in case we can come back to Waterford. Uh, and, and the shout itself may mean that we're, we're going to Dublin or we're going to Shannon or we're going to Cork. Um, so in that 15 minutes, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's very, very active. We're also changing possibly from our, our, our daytime kind of flight suit, possibly into a immersion suit, suit, depending on the time of the year. Because we're here on, in, on the coast, there's a very strong chance you could be going out over the sea. Oh yeah, oh, very much so. So we have an immersion suit, um, which obviously you can't wear you know, on, a, on a normal basis, shall we say. So it takes a couple of minutes to get into that. Uh, and then obviously once we're in that, normally what happens is that the duty co-pilot of the day will go out to the aircraft uh, and he'll get the aircraft started up and supervise any extra fuel that we might be getting. While well, the captain is having a conversation with the duty uh, winch up to say, right, this is the plan. Are we happy with the plan? This is where we're going. Are we happy with the weather? And the, the two of us in effect kind of say, yeah, look, this, we're, we're happy to go and, and, and we go. Typically, how many casualties can you assist? Uh, well, the, we've one stretcher. So primarily there's, there's one stretcher, but look, if it's, if it's a mass casualty incident, uh, let's say, for example, there's a, a vessel sinking, you know, you, you're going to take as many as, as necessary on board. Obviously, we recently uh, rescued seven people there, uh, the LEO uh, quite recently. Um, uh, look, if, if, if required, you can kind of fill them, but certainly if they're stretcher-related or spinal-related, then we're a bit more restricted in space. But yeah. Talk about uh, the uh, idea of CRM. People are always interested in crew resource management. How do you keep the whole crew involved in that process? Uh, well, we have a briefing every day. Uh, so a quarter past one, the, the six crew will get together. So I'm including the two engineers on that as well. Uh, and we, we set out a plan for the next 24 hours. Uh, it might be a case of, as I said, we might have an exercise already pre-booked. Or we might, if we don't, we'll, we'll plan a training flight. So we have various currencies that people will, will need to, to keep current. Um, so somebody might say, well, look, I, I need to do some decks or I need to do some cliffs or whatever. So we have, we have a, a good chat in that respect. And part, part of that briefing is the case is also, you know, is everybody kind of ready for the shift? Is you know, everybody kind of is it your start of a run of shifts? Is it the end of a run of shifts? All that sort of thing is taken into account. We headed out to rescue one one seven, where winchman Neville Murphy gave us a tour inside. Today is a special day, obviously 20 years down the road, uh, hard to believe that time went so fast and uh, you know we've been here for that time and integrated into the community as well, I think it is very particular, you know a lot of our work here in Waterford Airport and they've been a huge support to us throughout those 20 years as well, you know uh, I mean literally you can see here in the backdrop is, is the Comer Mountains, you know a couple of minutes flight time away, uh, Tremore Beach is just down the road there so we're, we're over water within minutes of, of this place as well so you know we've, we've kind of everything on our doorstep really here and it's a, it's a, it's a perfect spot for SAR. Now, are you, you're part of the active crew today. You're already in the gear. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I just came on shift in, in, in the middle of today so mm. we, we took over. We're on for 24 hours now. So uh, we'll just, we're all set up. We're actually going on a training flight uh, about four o'clock this afternoon. So, you know, the, the, we celebrate, but, you know, the work continues and uh, hopefully it'll stay quiet today. The helicopter were on and uh, the, uh, we should explain because people won't be able to see is the, the back ramp is open. Talk to me about the actual facilities and how this is helpful. Yeah, the SNL2 is a, is a beautiful platform. As you can mm. see, we're standing inside it. And, you know, for ourselves in the back in particular, we've two paramedics normally in the back of the aircraft. Mm. For us to be to walk around and you can see the stretcher station here as well. 
you know, we can we can stand over it. We can treat the people with the medical equipment mounted up in a, 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 um, a shelf here for it. And th- this ramp here, as you see in the back, it, it, the, the ramp lowers down and the door comes up, so we can literally walk a stretcher in and walk a stretcher out. Mm. So for particular like the Hems the uh, air ambulance kind of side of things, it's really beneficial for that. As well as you know, if we have the stretcher a patient, we can uh, get into the hospital and, and exit the aircraft pretty lively, you know, if, if if needs be. We hear medical people talk about a, a golden hour, a, a sort of a window of opportunity. How much does what's in this in this helicopter in this space here help? Yeah, it's it's huge. I mean, literally, it's a, it's a flying ambulance, you know, and and the crew in the back are, are trained as well. Uh, we have advanced paramedics and paramedics in the back, so the treatment is is at the, the upper level uh, from from the from that side of things, you know. So it's it's fantastic aircraft loads of space inside in it and absolutely ideal for that work how did you get into this many moons ago I was, I was in the military uh, the Irish Army and I transferred up to the Irish Air, Air Corps uh, flew in Alouettes for a while and, and Dauphins and, right. uh, for a couple of years and then progressed onto the uh, with the Irish Coast Guard into the and CHC uh, onto the 61 and now the 92 you know, memories of the 61 mission. did you like it she was like the old workhorse, to be honest, you know, and uh, I suppose that's the only way I describe it. And this is like the Porsche, uh, mm-hmm. and that's the that's the real. It's new technology. I mean, the the mission station we have them back for the winch crew with the with the floor an integrated mapping system with the front uh, two pilots in the front. So we've uh, it's really the the uh, crew concept front and back is is huge in this aircraft, and, and and it facilitates that with the technology on board. I wish you a quiet shift, and thanks for chatting to us. Thanks very much. No bother. <laughs> Mark O'Callaghan was the duty pilot on Friday last, and he had just come on duty. Mark O'Callaghan, we're here beside the helicopter, and you're all ready for action right this minute. Yeah, we just uh, came on shift at 1300 today, um, and that shift period uh, continues for 24 hours, so we'll be off going at 1300 tomorrow. Tell me about the helicopter, what it's like to fly. Uh, it's uh, an incredible bit of kit. It's uh, probably one of the newest um, S92s, uh, star wise, that we have. Um, $50 million worth. Um, the technology, albeit a little bit old, it's still a very, very capable aircraft. Um, Obviously, we have uh, dual engines, dual hoist for redundancy, um, and a special, specially prepared medical station at the back, which is a slight differs slightly from the other aircraft uh, from around the country. But the guys uh, in the back very, very much enjoy it. It's a great machine. What's the nature of the work that happens here out at Waterford? Uh, Waterford is well, is is kind of I wouldn't say it's unique, but we do get a nice broad spectrum of jobs um, because we have the Cumber Mountains quite close by, so we get up to the mountains quite a bit. Uh, we also have a lot of inshore calls as well and um, we do a lot of river searches people searches stuff like that and obviously we do the maritime element as well mm. offshore mm. yeah i believe there's something on the front of the helicopter that the guys were telling me about this forward facing infrared correct yeah so that's one of the main bits of kit that we have f- for navigating well it helps us with navigation but also for the guys in the back to pick out people in the water mm. to identify targets uh, and we use it through all phases of flight so it's a very very important bit of kit for us how do you find a person or a small boat or a, a life raft in a, in a sea? Initially if a call was to come in from MRCC if we were lucky enough to have a rough location uh, of where the incident is, that does help it kind of narrows it down and then another thing is like if people themselves kind of have uh, personal locator beacons on board, that's uh, that's even a, a bigger help as well, so we'd always encourage people if they are out in the water to uh, be, be well equipped when you're out in the water. So we'd get an initial call, um, a rough position of where the person would be and we'd literally we would just go out, initially we would start to search uh, just looking out the window um, and then this is where the FLIR then really comes into its own because it can scan a massive area very very quickly and what it works off is heat signature so it's able to pick up heat signature very very quickly and there's a excellent uh, definition and clarity in the screen so that's one of the main things that we would use to pick up people at sea. Finally how did you end up in this position? I started flying back in well I was, I was still in university at the stage and I was doing my private pilot's licence um, finished university uh, worked for about a year decided I wanted to do the flying full time so then I went to America trained there for two years I came back then and I actually started to work for CHC over in Aberdeen flying to the oil rigs for about five years on the S92 and then transferred to CHC Ireland to fly in the SAR contract for the Irish Coast Guard so I've been here about five years now What's today look like for you and the expectation that you don't get an actual call out what what would be the plans? Barring a call we're just going to do planning a training sortie later on Um, so we'll probably lift at maybe about three or four 
four o'clock and we generally try to get up for about two hours of training every shift so we'll um, we'll just see see what's around if there's a if there's a boat offshore that's uh, willing to do some winching we might do that we might go into the mountains we can go wherever it's a, it's a great position to be in so it's not just sitting having a cup of tea for the day no 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 that, that'll come later <laughs> Mark O'Callan thanks for chatting to us no problem thanks very much well, stay with us on this episode coming up in part two we talk with the airport manager at Waterford Aidan Power about the future of this essential regional airport you're listening to Squawk 7000 Ireland's aviation podcast we're in Waterford Airport celebrating 20 years of CHC and Rescue 117 at the base here and while we're here we're also catching up too on the airport itself and its manager Aidan Power Hi uh, Aidan Power here the airport manager uh, for Waterford Airport I'm delighted you can be here today A real pleasure actually and as we mentioned earlier we had the pleasure of flying into the airport too and actually quite busy there was a fair amount of traffic coming in as well the story of Waterford right now and then we'll go back and talk about where it's come from and maybe where it's going to but what's happening here right now? Right now we've got obviously CHC are based here for its search and rescue for Irish Coast Guard which is uh, something that uh, we're very proud of over the years uh, obviously today 20 years uh, anniversary and we've got quite a bit of GA activity as well we've got uh, the Aero Club doing pilot training you've got uh, after do pilot training uh, and I suppose we've always been associated now that I say it with pilot training for many many years uh, I think probably about four pilot training schools over the years uh, back from the Iona days and uh, East ECA and all those uh, have been based here mm. and uh, so it's GA has always been part and parcel of what we do here and we've got executive aircraft coming in going out as well. It's an eclectic mix of uh, you never quite know mm. uh, what's going to turn up on any particular day from you know a Gulf Stream to uh, an unusual general aviation aircraft um, so yeah it can be quite interesting helicopter ops as well mm. so there's uh, and you can get unusual activities for periods of time like geo- geographical surveying maritime survey that sort of stuff so um, what tends to happen is uh, a group who may have heard of Waterford Airport or have tried this before if something fits they tend to come back to you uh, a regional airport like this can be a good fit for some mm. operations mm. Uh, of that nature because it is actually a, it's a snapshot of, of, of an international airport yes. you, you have all the experience all the nav aids the air traffic control and even, dare I say, on your on Sky Demon, which is used by pilots for navigation, your ratings are extremely high in terms of friendliness. So all really? of that's in place. But I suppose people would also be curious to know about commercial flights in and out of this particular region. That must be a challenge for you as the as the airport manager to have that on your agenda. Sure. Well, look, we've been doing uh, scheduled flights from the from the eighties. Uh, obviously, famous Ryanair started. The early Waterford. days of Ryanair. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, back in the Bandaranti days, and then moved on to the seven four eight and the ATRs and mm. and so on. So they were interesting days for sure to be part of it. Uh, I started in the business in eighty eight when Ryanair were here uh, as uh, part of the airport operations side. So uh, a full I've been involved in the full gambit of of operations, mm. and yeah, scheduled services have run. We had Air Iron here, Bridge Regional Airways, uh, Flybe was very successful here as well. I suppose we kind of went through uh, a very good phase in in the 90s, was very strong, uh, 2000s as well. When Air Iron were here, um, probably the London route was one of their best routes on, on all of their networks. It was it was that strong. And, and VLM were the final uh, airline to finish up here in 2016. So the general I suppose the way that's developed is it's difficult to compete really when you've got a um, 50 seater or 60 seater turboprop yeah. competing in today's terms with um, a jet runway where there's 180 seats and with the best will in the world <coughs> even though we would have had very high load factors for the like of uh, Flybe on a, mm. a Dash 8 and at times for the Birmingham route it would have been up in the high 80s mm. uh, 90% the price point is a very difficult proposition and you can sell a place like Waterford Airport or any of the other regions really on a convenience factor and there's always that kind of line where uh, people 
people are happy to pay uh, what they would see is you know some extra uh, cost and that's basically because the seat price if you've got 50 people as opposed to 180 people or 60 people according as opposed to 180 people obviously the price point is going to be higher and so people are happy to pay a certain amount and there's a comfort zone in that but there is a limit to that as well and uh, and, and therein is the challenge uh, well, what the growth of seems to be the way you describe it there is the business aircraft so I yeah. mean you have the infrastructure here um, and people can actually use this as an entry point into the country from uh, from their executive aircraft yeah we get quite a few uh, executive aircraft everything quite a, a gambit of, of aircraft type actually um, for people who have residencies in the southeast to the businesses the pharmaceuticals and others um, because in in essence for the south particularly in Waterford there's no real headquarters here so anybody who wants to expand any of the businesses who are here are looking at expanding they need to get a, a European or a world CEO into the country it's not a great proposition to fly them into Dublin and do a two and, and a half drive them down yeah, exactly they, yeah. it's yeah. very difficult yeah. for them yeah. so flying into Waterford is and they're 15 minutes into the city or into their business or half an hour it's you know it's it's a, it's a real winner for them thankfully the airport road was developed uh, the old road was quite uh, something um, and when they put the new infrastructure in you've got the business park next door which is independent of us but you know, I think it really helped uh, the whole strategy of trying to develop the airport. And in fairness to the county council, uh, city and county council, which is one now, um, they are very pro airport, uh, Wexford as well, and Kilkenny. So part of what we're trying to do at the moment is, obviously we've made a, a planning application for a runway extension. That has been successful. Mm. Uh, a bit longer than we would have liked. It has taken probably two years between the planning and, and CPOs, etc. So we've been successful with that uh, for the first time we've probably looked at runway extensions since the 90s but it didn't happen for various reasons and um, we're trying to put together an investment uh, proposition for expanding the runway uh, lengthwise and widening it to uh, we'll call it regional jet status so you can now get into mainstream 737 Airbus 320 kind of status and along with that obviously the business aircraft as well those ones that are might be a little bit shy of landing on a shorter runway who are used to kind of 2000 metres plus runway uh, it opens it up to that as well. Finally, uh, we have general aviation pilots listening to this podcast. What's your message to them if they're going flying this summer? Well, certainly give us a try. Uh, I think we've always had a, a very good attitude towards general aviation. I, I, not to be too put off by the idea of air traffic control or ATC space. Uh, the controllers here are have been here for many, many years, used to a general aviation community and, you know, are very happy to talk people through the process. And, and we would... We had to kind of stop it, I suppose, for the COVID uh, yes, the yeah. process. But we used to actually encourage pilots to come up to the control tower when there was time available to do it and let them see what it's like from an air traffic controller's perspective. Yeah. I did ATC for about 10 years. Right. Uh, it's part of my uh, growth over the years. So, you know, we're very aware of what the pilot's view of life is. And it's nice if the, if the controllers could see it from, or sorry, the pilot can see it from the controller's yeah. perspective as well. Not to be put off by ATC or the process of control airspace it's it is here it is here to stay unfortunately for for ga pilots i know yeah. uh, many kind of uh, uh, lament the old, you know class g lots of class g yeah. around yeah. but um i suppose you know it's inevitable yeah. that uh, more control airspace was going to come in but i wouldn't you know certainly give give it a go and uh, always make the phone call first if you can get the controller at the other end of the phone it's always good especially if you're a first time flyer into that particular area Drone, they'll they'll cop onto that very quickly, and and you know you'll get a good rapport, and it's always a good thing from my perspective. And that's our episode. Congratulations again to the crews of Rescue One One Seven, and also to Winchman Sarah Courtney, the recipient of the 2021 National Bravery Awards. I'm off to file a flight plan. We'll talk to you again soon.